Well, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It's the 23rd of November, 2011, uh, the day before Thanksgiving. And uh, I, Monica said there was turkey in uh, cooking behind her, and there might be cooking behind you too. But um, we are here to talk about um, open educational resources and whatever else comes up with a couple of guests that we've invited here tonight. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, and so let's start with the introductions. And Tara, you're at the top of my screen. Do you want to introduce yourself first? Sure. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Antero Garcia. I'm an English teacher at Manual Arts High School in South Central Los Angeles. Um, this year I'm doing a bit of coaching, but I've mainly taught 11th and 12th graders and 9th graders and ESL in the past. Um, I'm also currently a doctoral candidate at UCLA, so I'm finishing up my dissertation over there, um, focusing on uh, mobile media, uh, phones, and gameplay to develop critical literacy. So I've been kind of jumping around between uh, two different worlds and uh, getting a little bit of a lack of sleep as a result, but I'm excited to be here this evening. Cool. Karen. Please introduce yourself. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Fassenpower. Um, I work with K-12 schools um, doing in-classroom coaching and mentoring and professional development and curriculum development um, around mobile learning and blended learning. And I do a lot of work in open education. And I'm excited to be here tonight to talk about that. And I used to teach middle school, and I taught in Africa for a couple of years, which was a totally fabulous experience. Great. Um, and the two of you will have to kind of describe to us open educational resources and your connection there, too. But let's get the other guests here, too. Scott, Scott uh, has been a frequent guest with us, has been a student teacher and in an elementary school, third grade, I think. Right, Scott? And I encourage Scott to speak up tonight. <laughs> Scott, how you doing? Can you hear me Welcome. okay, Paul? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. All right, new, got a new headset. I'm trying it out. So. It's working. Yep, I'm a student teacher in a small town in Indiana. Just about done. Four more weeks to go. Great. Welcome. And Dave Rogers, brand new to our show. Introduce yourself, please. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, I am Day Rogers. I am a uh, MFA film student at UCLA, and I specialize in documentary film and working with youth. Cool. Great. Monica, what's going on with you this week? <laughs> oh, that's a different question than everyone else. I know. <laughs> you can introduce yourself. I, I will You're right. say Go ahead. to Antero, yeah. perhaps sleep is overrated. When, when we went to New York, we found out about these pods these sleep pods that they have in the um, Empire State Building. Oh, yeah, sleep pod? I'm thinking we all need those. I, we never saw them, but um, we were imagining they're these just big, round things that you get in. You sleep for like 10 minutes, and people pay for them like they pay for like a, you know, a, what, whatever you call it when you get a gym, you know, a membership to a gym, you have a membership to these sleep pods. The sleep pod? Wow. I don't know how I feel about that. Think of all we can do with that, because sleep is so overrated. Okay, <laughs> that's enough for <of> me. <laughs> Monica, why don't you tell us who you are and what you've been up to? Okay. And then I, I'll um, actually I'm introduce Kristen. myself after you do. Go ahead. <laughs> We've um, been crowdsourcing for the last four years um, kids and how they would redefine school. And they, two years ago, came up with a plan, and we're in year two of that plan, so we're prototyping left and right. Um, we, the second year we have a house uh, in the city that now is a prototype of what we imagine the city to be at the end of year four. It also resembles the web in many ways, um, that the walls are link, have links, you know, uh, QR code links, and that's what we envision the city to be in the future where um, spaces are enlivened because of combination of old and young people coming together and deciding the purpose of the city and uh, and of life how about that that's cool um and i'm a teacher at a high school in the bronx 
Uh, this week I was able to run in and back every day this week, so I'm feeling good. <laughs> um, so it's it's about five miles from my home, and I run right across the Bronx to it. It's uh, the Bronx Academy Senior High, and uh, attendance was pretty low today, but I had a lot of fun with the kids who showed up. So I had one girl singing at the top of her lungs, um, <laughs> and and uh, kids doing lots of different things in what is, I guess, still a computer lab, but it's uh, lots of things now. <laughs> and it's my classroom. Um, so, and you know what, uh, Open Ed, um, I'll kick it off by saying that uh, one of the sites that these kids were posting their work on is called youthvoices.net. And uh, it's absolutely, you know, we're going to have to get into what is a free resource and what isn't a free resource a little bit here. Um, but um, it's a it's a certainly free to anybody who wants to come join the site. And um, we have a thing on it we call missions where we try to share curriculum and so forth. So when I think of um, open educational resources, that's one of the places where I think I contribute to that community in some way. So let's um, talk about all of that. Um, and I realized I need to be clicking. Uh, Karen, can we turn to you or to Intero since you guys did some of this panel work at NCTE on this very subject and just have you give us a definition. Can we start there? What is open educational resources and why should we care? <laughs> that was a little bit of a joke. But <laughs> Karen, let's turn to you. Okay. Yeah, good. Um, so I got involved with Open Education Resources about three or four years ago, mostly through work I was doing with students building multimedia stuff. And it could, you know, videos, websites, whatever they were creating. And wanting to encourage the kids not to, not to break copyright, especially if they're publishing it online. Um, and, and fair use might not apply. And I got involved in open educational resources as a result of that, looking for multimedia content that we could use legally. So I think um, a, a good working definition of open is materials that are free, not only in the sense that you don't have to pay for them, but also free in the bigger sense um, that you can, you can do things with them. So particularly with open educational resources, they're free to use but also to remix and redistribute. So you could incorporate things that are under an open license into a podcast or into a movie and redistribute that to other people. Um, and the most, the most common open license, so, so the licensing piece of it, the person who creates it still owns copyright, but they're just saying it's okay for other people to share this stuff. And they're saying that explicitly through an open license like Creative Commons would be the most common one. And I think it's it's important to differentiate between things that are open the way um, I just defined it and things that are just free because there is there is a difference in terms of how you can actually use it. Make that distinction stronger then. What do you mean? Go ahead. So all the free stuff, I mean, basically everything on the internet is, is free, well, Everything that's not behind a firewall on the internet is free. And, you know, it's as easy as just right click and copy and put it in anything you want. But if it's not open licensed, if it's under what we call an all rights reserved license, which is, which is a traditional copyright, which is kind of the default in the United States, um, you're, legally you're supposed to ask permission of the creator to, to do something with it with the exception of fair use, um, which Antero might want to say more about fair use, but I just, you know, what I usually say is what a lot of people's conception of fair use is really a lot narrower than what people think. It doesn't mean that just because you're a teacher, you can do anything you want with anything copyrighted on the internet. But op the open stuff gets around all that because the people are explicitly saying it's okay for you to do whatever you want with this. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so I, I spent part of the NCT talking about fair use and, and how it's applied um, for teachers because I, I think one of the challenges is we're not 
um, particularly well educated about fair use, um, either in teacher education programs or in professional development. And I think there's a tendency for uh, like book publishers and um, for-profit companies to want us to be fearful of copyright um, and to not recognize ways that we can use it within our classrooms. Um, so I've been reading, um, well, I've read in the past tense at this point, uh, this book, Reclaiming Fair Use, I'll show my screen here. Um, <laughs> and it's actually been a really useful text in terms of thinking about, um, one, how to engage students in conversations about fair use, and uh, as a teacher to think about that myself, because um, I know my practice is predominantly, I'm sure many other teachers have been, um, use whatever, whenever, because it's going to get students through the day. And, I'm, and I, I think that would terrify a lot of publishers, and um, I think we, we've moved past worrying about the law, but as, as we think about what our students are going to be doing beyond our classrooms, this is really a time for us to think about how we're going to educate them um, about what are the, the appropriate ways to use material that may not necessarily be open um, as they're uh, putting a song in the background of their PowerPoint video um, or as they're doing all the types of productive tech activities that happen throughout the day in, in extracurricular time. Um, and so reclaiming fair use is just good because it's got um, various scenarios um, that you can look at both online and offline. Um, and the other resource uh, related to this that I pointed out was um, a comic book, a digital comic book that's free online called Bound by Law that's made for predominantly filmmakers, but it's got some useful examples that kids and teachers can look at. Um, so I think that's just kind of enough about the fair use stuff. Um, but I think those have been really useful tools for me to think about um, in talking to other teachers about challenges with copyright. Hey, Antero, can you hold that book up again and tell us the author of that book? Yes. I'm going to try to tell you the author, but I know I'm going to butcher, uh, butcher the author's name. A little book. higher. Maybe we can see it. Okay, good. Um, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll move it in. It's Patricia Aufterheide and Peter Jassi, J-A-S-Z-I. <laughs> Neither of them have easy last names, so I'm just going to say Patricia and Peter are the co-authors on this one. Um, okay. Yeah. Couple, Thank you. A couple years ago, we had Peter on the show to kind of explain okay. it all, and he's a wonderful explainer <laughs> um, of all of yeah, this. Yeah, his, his, his book's great, I mean, in terms of just kind of explaining stuff. So, But, you know, one of the things that um, is often said about fair use in teachers is if we could learn from documentary filmmakers, we'd be better off. Um, so, and we have a documentary filmmaker here, right? So, so do you want to tell us, uh, how do you think about fair use? Is that, and what do you think teachers might learn from that? Uh, well, oh, no. I know I, I discuss this with teachers a lot. Um, I worked with Antero before with his kids and a couple of other teachers at his school. And we do talk about the fact that when they want to put their footage on YouTube, sometimes they run into problems because they want to use a popular song, whatever. Um, unfortunately, we don't really talk about, I mean, in the classroom as a student, our teacher rarely talks about that sort of thing as well, like at our level. And it's us it usually comes down to, well, if you get distribution, can the people who are buying your film, can they afford to pay for the music you have in your film? So usually the thing they say is, if you're interviewing someone, turn off the music or turn off the TV or try to remove anything that has a copyright. That's as far as it gets with what they teach us. They really don't talk about um, Creative Commons and, and uh, finding resources that are for people who want to create or remix things. So we don't even really talk about remixing and how we can go out and take something that someone else created and they're giving you permission to use and then bring it in, into your own work. So I'm, I'm curious about this whole conversation and how teachers want to use it. Because as a filmmaker, I'm trying to figure that out myself. Cool. So, so, so I'm sorry, but say a little more. What are you trying to figure out yourself as a filmmaker? Well, I, I'm just trying to figure out myself um, the extent to, you know, what's fair use, what's Creative Commons, and it's it's. I think it's just it's a case by case basis. And you kind of just have to go with the flow and hope you're not breaking any rules. Because as a student, I can do whatever I want right now and then just bring it into the classroom. But when it comes time to say I want to distribute something on the web, I have to, okay, okay, I have to recut it or I have to use music that's free or I have to rethink things. So we don't even really talk about it in the classroom at our level in terms of being filmmakers. 
Got it. What are we looking out there? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It looks awesome, though. Scott, I've been, what I've been is trying that? To, to scrutinize it. What's that happening? Was, that's that's the chat. <laughs> that's going on over at edtech. Yeah, that's the chat. No, no. I can't live. see it. How do we? <laughs> how do we make it so we can read it? Uh, you, if you clicked on his screen, you could see it. I think. Hey, Paul. A couple people in the yeah. other room want to know if they can join the Google Hangout. Can I Absolutely. send them the link? Yeah. Um, but if they're in the chat, there's a link right at the top of the chat that they can click, and they'll come right here. Oh, okay. Yeah, most of the time that doesn't work, Paul. It hasn't worked the last two weeks for me. Oh, really? Because it worked yeah. this week for me. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll just copy and paste it and stick it in there. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, uh, how do we get back? Here, here's here's what I would like to do. I, you know, I'm really interested in thinking about it from the side of how we can make things more shareable. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? So I'm I'm not so concerned about the legal stuff. I'm concerned about um, how we can make this show, for example, or anything else. I mean, we put this show out there live for free, but how can we make what we put out on the web more dialogical? Is that a question you're shaking your head go ahead karen yeah put Karen's it here. under a creative commons license so anybody yeah, who wants to share already, their yeah. stuff if it's oh if you're okay with people sharing it just license it under creative commons and that tells people it's okay to share and the easiest way to do that is you can just put licensed cc by mm -hmm. um that means that the people have to attribute you as a source which is a requirement of um of creative commons all creative commons licenses and then if you want to get fancier, you can go to the Creative Commons website and they have a license picker where you can go and they'll give you a little artwork and a, um, some HTML snippet that'll make your stuff um, searchable through um, search engines. Like if you go to Google and you do a search and then you do an advanced search, you can go in and say only search stuff that's Creative Commons licensed so you know that it's okay to use. So if you put that um, HTML snippet on your website, then that'll make it easier for people to find it. Mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of uh, social networking uh, websites also allow you to do that. Off, um, Flickr has it, uh, and I know that Vimeo has it, so it's an option that you can automatically say is Creative Commons, you can do whatever, and the different, you can say you can remix it, but you have to give me, a, you know, you have to attribute it to me, and that sort of thing. So I think the fact that different sites are now, it's built in, is a good thing. Definitely. Yeah, one of the, a couple of the resources we shared um, at the in the panel were particularly around things that offer Creative Commons license and ways to share them. So, um, using Flickr, right, to for students to find images for presentations, um, and, and selecting Creative Commons uh, photos, um, Creative Commons licensed photos through uh, Flickr is really useful. Um, and then the one that uh, Paulo, who can't join us tonight. Um, shared was obviously digital is the, the National Writing Project's digital literacies website um, and that everything posted on there is um, posted through a Creative Commons license. Um, it's just a really great place for, for teachers to get involved um, in discussion, in conversation, in ways that um, aren't just sharing out lesson plans but are sharing out um, practices and, and using those to engage in conversation, um, which, which I think is what I like about the digital is model as it is right now. So I have a question. Um, do you guys think there's ever going to come a point where we we don't even need Creative Commons? The trend in the law is that copyright is getting longer and it's getting more restrictive. And I mean, the reason for that is obviously lobbyists and the, the film and music industry. I do a um, session where I talk with kids about copyright. And it's, it's funny because I, I was saying in the chat, Teachers kind of copyright is such an onerous topic and people kind of zone out and it's not that interesting. But I think kids are really engaged in this topic because they see themselves more as content producers. And one of the things I always talk with the kids about is, you know, what's happening with copyright law and why do they think that is? And then we get into a whole conversation about, you know, lobbying and money and Congress and all that stuff. But I mean, I think there's a lot of people who are um, working in an activist role to 
you know, make things more open and also to expand fair use. Um, but I think, you know, the money is behind not doing that. I think so one of the interesting it. things, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Karen. No, you're fine, go ahead. I think one of the interesting and things I, I think will be happening um, is we're going to see a convergence of um, copyright law and patent law and the way those two are going to be intermixing, particularly as young people are going to be writing it and producing um, literacy-based products that also become patentable ideas through app creation and, and things like that. Um, I think that'll be an interesting place where, where legal things are going to get into a fairly messy area. I um, mean, that patents function in this way, and there's that whole um, bidding war between Google and whoever else it was a couple months ago, and copyright functions this way. And I don't think um, we've really thought about how these two are going to be converging um, in our classrooms and beyond in the next few years. I, so I'm going to try to ask a question again, um, and because <laughs> I'm still not getting I would like to assume that everything's legal for a second, and, and we have this wonderful world where everybody's, everybody's sharing Creative Commons stuff. But I want to problematize the open ed resource community a little bit and, and ask if we are really sharing as much as we could be um, and how we might share better and more thoughtfully and more carefully and then so here's here's how i thought to think <laughs> to ask this this time um the p2p university seems to be a platform where sharing might happen in a more thoughtful kind of careful way um Maybe Karen, can you describe what's going on there? And do you understand my question at least, or does somebody try to understand? I do. <laughs> like, I'm more, I'm less interested in worrying about the legal stuff and more interested in figuring out um, how we can share better. <laughs> if that makes sense. Well, I mean, I think the legal part of it is a big piece of it because I think a lot of people share. You know, they put stuff on the internet and they think they're sharing and they think that they're sharing sort of to the full extent. Yeah. And I think, I mean, a lot of people I know, they post photos on the internet because they want to share them. But, I mean, definitely the default is all rights reserve copyright. So if somebody is, you know, if somebody knows about copyright and they're being attentive to it, that's not fully sharing. I mean, I understand what you're saying. It's kind of nitpicky, but let me, I'll mm -hmm. talk about P2PU. Um, so P2PU or Peer-to-Peer -peer University um, is a it's a grassroots sort of non-traditional um, online educational environment that's based on three things: um, community, um, openness, and peer learning. And the whole idea of it is all about um, it's really you know peer-to-peer -peer university. It's based on peer learning, um, but it's it's based on taking advantage of all the open resources that are out there on the internet and then also everything that's posted on P2PU is um, is open licensed and it's under a CC BY share alike license. Um, and we started a school of ed at Peer to Peer University about just at the beginning of this summer and... Who's the we in that? <laughs> People ask me that a lot. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's I am you. a. I am a. <laughs> no, it's I. Well, well. I guess the idea to start the school of ed was my idea. Um, yeah. I got involved with the P2PU sort of as a community member, and I would say it's similar to um, Wikipedia in that it's an open community, and most of the work is done by volunteers and what they call community members. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had done a course, I had facilitated a course on P2PU, not in education, because I, I just wanted to see what the platform was like and kind of play around with it. So I did an um, entrepreneurial marketing course about a year ago, hmm. and I had a great time. The people there were fabulous, and I just, it was really a lot of fun. And so since all my sort of real work is um, in education, and I've been spent, I spent a lot of the last two years trying to find better models for professional development, because I think most professional development K-12 schools is pretty um, ineffective would be the kindest thing I would say, including some of the stuff I do. It's just, you know, it's just not great. So um, 
So I um, came up with an idea to start the School of Ed on PPU, kind of as a pilot, and um, got a group of people together, and just the most fabulous group of people. So we developed and launched seven courses over the summer. And one of them I would definitely call everybody's attention to is there's a course on writing in the Common Core that Bud Hunt did. Mm -hmm. And I know he was hoping to join us and didn't make it, but it's a really fabulous course. Maybe next week. Um, and then, Good. Yeah. And there's just, I mean, there's a course on differentiating instruction. There's one on student engagement. There's one on OER, using OER, particularly in K-12. Um, and we're just finishing our pilot um, round of courses. But just to talk about the sharing thing, so mm -hmm. what's cool about P2PU is everything on there is open license. So if any school wanted to download all these course materials and do anything they wanted with them, you could put them on your own server, you could print out a million copies. I mean, you can do, that's kind of the beauty of open licensing is you have that ability to redistribute. And things that are on the internet but that aren't open licensed, except within the fairly narrow what I would say is fairly narrow bounds of fair use. You don't really have that ability mm -hmm. legally. You bring up Wikipedia, and we're thinking what better platform for sharing, you know, as opposed to most things we do in school. You know, if, if kids were editing that, and that was all our playing field, what do you guys think about that? Um, I had my students edit Wikipedia, the school Wikipedia page, um, <laughs> last, last year. And it was interesting because I, I was trying to show them the principles of, of how it's enforced. And I think what I like about how, um, about what I, what I see as open is an idea of community, which I think is what I, I hear Paul trying to push back on is if we all have our own small little communities, it's kind of like I have my tribe and my, my box of toys over here and you have your box of toys over there. Um, and Wikipedia is kind of like the best example of an open non-community that I can think of in that way. Um, and so an example of that is um, when I went on to Wikipedia, I showed students that I can delete everything from our school's web page or our school's entry on Wikipedia and just type Mr. Garcia's awesome, hit submit. And for about five seconds, the Wikipedia page for Manual Arts High School is only my name and, and is great and the students loved it. And then as soon as I hit refresh, um, some nameless, faceless person has, has recognized that I'm up to no good and has reverted, it, has reverted the page back to uh, what it's supposed to be, um, or supposed to be in quotation marks, right? Um, and so it was a good example for students to really learn needing to use appropriate citations. And so ultimately the students were able to update the Wikipedia page so that it had, um, inform it was still factual information, but um, pro provided a more critical perspective of the school. So for example, how many security are at the school, what the dropout rates are at the school, information that pe the authors of that page previously um, opted to um, omit from the, from the website. And so what I thought about Wikipedia is it's a really useful website for students to understand um, the need for research and, and um, the need for rigor in, in engaging online, but it doesn't necessarily show what an online community or a space looks like in that sense. I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it seems like a pretty good online space. So mm -hmm. tell me more what you're thinking about that. Um, I guess I felt like you never quite get to see um, individuals within. It's, it's very faceless, I think, in Wikipedia, except in certain examples. So um, there's, there's an interesting um, page. There's an interesting article, I think, in the all a couple months ago. Um, about commenting and controversy in the Lolita Wikipedia page because so many people are going back and forth over yeah, interpretations and things like that. Um, and I've actually been looking at the comment history for, I think it's um, the um, Sadai Strategies um, Wikipedia page, probably the geekiest reading you can do on Wikipedia is to read about Sadai. Um, but in looking at that, you can see there's a couple of commenters that go back and forth one from England and one from some place in, I can't remember which state in, California, in the United States. Um, and they kind of go back and forth. And you can see these two different personalities emerge. And one is, is sharing their expertise as an older teacher. One is sharing their expertise as a researcher. And so these are very few moments in the back channel of Wikipedia where you see this kind of engagement. Um, but it's not, I think, apparent on the front end. So maybe, maybe it's just a matter of um, changing that perspective for, for students too. So. You could be right. I mean, maybe or, that's a, or could it be that just none of us, not not enough of us, are using it? You know, 
That's Not what enough I'm wondering. If, if, if we were, if we decided this was, because I, what I see, and this could be completely wrong, I could be speaking in complete ignorance here, but what I see is everyone trying to create the spaces for us to mm -hmm. share. When we've already got some incredible spaces, mm -hmm. it seemed to be a common place that all of us are, are heading towards. And so I'm just questioning, you know, yeah, I see the what you're saying. There's not, and I've tried to add stuff on there, and it seems difficult. But maybe, maybe that's where we could be sharing more without doing all this other stuff. And if it does bring rigor, and if it does tend to be something that's useful in the end, I think that's what a lot of us are craving, especially kids. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a good sentiment. I'm not I'm not sure where it will go. Right, so. I, I like I like the optimism of that of that statement. Maybe, maybe I'll leave my thought there. Well, let me ask: Is Wikipedia an OER? It is. I would say yes. How? It's it, it's yeah. well, it's open licensed. So the text of Wikipedia is all licensed under CC BY <coughs> share alike. And the images are licensed under a variety of open licenses, whatever the um, creator or copyright owner chooses. But it has to be open. If you put something up that's not open license, they'll take it down very quickly. So in that sense, it's open. Um, and it's certainly, I mean, I would certainly say it's an educational resource. Um, one of the ways we've used Wikipedia in K-12 schools, just and this sort of shows how you could leverage OERs. Um, I do a lot of work with mobile technology and eBooks. And we used to always write these ebooks for kids because there's really not a lot of ebooks for kids and certainly not a lot of open licensed ones. And so we would create all this content, um, which when I when we sort of when I knew about Creative Commons, we started open licensing more of that. So there's some available. But another thing we've done is taken um, Wikipedia articles and adapted them for student use and pu republished them as um, open ebooks. So, you know, we've taken the part that's most important and adapted it to kid language, but still a lot easier to take a Wikipedia article and adapt it for a fifth grader than to write a whole, you know, from scratch ebook. So that's kind of like the beauty of remixing. Mm -hmm. And Monica, I would, I mean, I can give a quick example of a young man I'm working with. His name is Noah. I've mentioned him before. He's part of a hip hop uh, Dominican music group. And I've been having him write about his experiences there. And I've even tried to get that group on our show because they want to show their studio off. And he does a lot of learning in that studio. And I'm learning from him in lots of ways. Um, and his assignment right now is to create a Wikipedia page about that group. And then he decided he didn't want to do it about the group. There's one particular guy. He wants to do his biography. So he's looking into different biographies. And he's, he's happy to find out that some of the biographies get closed off pretty fast. There's a Wikipedia allows you to close biographies pretty fast. Anyway, so there's, there's plenty of work to do there. But I, it's certainly not an open enough platform for a lot of different kinds of genre that I want kids to be writing. It's certainly one kind of genre I want kids to be writing, but it's not enough, <laughs> if I could say that. It also yeah. it also only privileges uh, like westernized forms of knowledge. And I, this was an article that I've read recently that you know uh, for um, for cultures that you know value. Um, spoken forms of knowledge and storytelling, there's no way to put that up on Wikipedia because there isn't a documented history of it, right? So one of the examples that, that people have talked about is um, trying to explain the rules to a popular game that people play in India as children. Um, but because it's not, there's no rule book that, that's published or anything like that, you can't just cite your neighbor or your mother or your father, um, which I think is an important part of, of how we share and disperse knowledge that mm -hmm. um, isn't embraced in something like Wikipedia, right? Mm -hmm. And we're getting around to what I want the question, what I, what my question is, is all I'll say. Um, <laughs> and and it is it is sort of like 
what are the platforms where we could do more sharing of all this wonderful stuff we have and and so that there's more conversation around the work um and you know wikipedia is certainly one place are there other places digital is is one place we can start share, sharing stuff um peer-to-peer -peer university um but even there karen if you could say a little more about why you thought it was important to set up the education um, school. That would be interesting to me. It, it would get at my question, which is like, I don't think the problem is legal stuff. I don't think the problem is that we're not sharing. I think the problem is we're not conversing about what we're sharing about. Is that? Yeah, I agree. A, I agree. Yeah. So the big draw for me on P2PU was I mean, initially, I think I'm, I found it because it was open, but the big draw for me was peer learning. And I think, you know, everybody, all the teachers I know are really smart and bring a lot to the table, and many of them could do better professional development than the really expensive experts their district bring in mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. I think put on professional development that's not always that effective. So what was interesting to me about P2PU was really um, an approach that peer learning is at the center of. Um, and I think, you know, that has its own challenges. One of the things that um, that I'm sort of thinking through and struggling with now is just, you know, what does peer learning look like to different people and how do you engage teachers who aren't accustomed to peer learning um, to, to get engaged in that? And we're looking at um, doing a, a, a group so some of the P2PU stuff is, it, they call it courses, and it's kind of a more traditional course format, but they also have just seminars and discussion groups and kind of more open formats. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at doing a group on just what is what is pers what does personal learning look like and how, um, how, can, how do people take the initiative to drive their own learning and what does that look like and how does peer learning fit into that? And I think that's pretty interesting stuff, but it's pretty different from how a lot of K-12 teachers, I think, are used to um, approaching their own learning. So but I mean, more, I think it just has so much merit. It's pretty exciting. You're, you're right in our wheelhouse when you talk about that, though. Can you say more about how, what did you just say there? It was something about how personal learning grows? Yeah, and just, That's I mean, how, how, how do you yeah. take control of your own learning and, you know, make it make it about what you want to do. So one of the things that was interesting about P2PU is I think that more professional development should be what teachers think they need to learn or what they want to learn instead of, you know, whatever the hot initiative of the day is that everybody's going to do professional development on. So part of the idea of P2PU is, you know, that the ideas for these courses, now we're, we're in a really early phase, but that the ideas for these courses come from the participants themselves and that we kind of mm -hmm. all build the courses or the groups together instead of um, you know somebody out in wherever building a course for teachers that may or may not deal with what they really need to learn or what they want to learn. You're hitting on a key aspect of what we've been working on and questioning the publicly prescribed curriculum as opposed to working on the delivery of that you know. And if you're talking personalized learning, what we've experienced over the years, if, if, if you want a person to have enough drive to do, to do it on their own, um, it really does have to come from within. And, and somewhere outside saying what they should learn, um, most of us don't have enough willpower to, to keep after that and to keep after it in a sincere way so that it's authentic learning, you know, so. So that whole motivation piece is really interesting to me. And one of the things we've sort of gone back and forth, and I don't even know what I think about it anymore, but just the issue of does there need to be, um, or is there merit to there being some kind of formal credit associated with these courses? Because um, I think, you know, our original thought was they would be driven by internal motivation and we just wouldn't deal with credit because of all the complexities of that. But then when I think about the professional development I do in a, 
not on P2PU in in the kind you know the kind that I would have to say I like doing a lot less and I find is less effective and interesting. But the P, the teachers who attend are either paid a pretty good stipend and or they're getting formal credit. And I I appreciate that you know people teachers are really busy and if there's one constraint on everything right now it seems like it's time even more than money um, and so you know we've gone around and around about are we going to do credit and and you know is that a good thing or is that a bad thing I think I think sometimes that's I think it particularly stipends but even credit I think sometimes it can almost take away from the intrinsic motivation I don't know. I'm interested in people's thoughts about that. I, th I think, and Paul and I actually briefly started talking about concepts of, of badges um, <laughs> on uh, on Friday. Um, it's a but sub I think theme. One of, the, one of the challenges when what, what's that? It's a sub theme in my life right now. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that question. Um, <laughs> but I think just com coming back to what, what you're saying, Karen. One, one of the challenges is if if we only do these kinds of activities voluntarily, the current I think political climate around teaching um, really shows us as the deprofessionalized field, and um, in some ways we kind of need to have some sort of um, recognition on a resume or some kind of credential showing these kinds of trainings, just in terms of um, I think leverage in terms of where we are as a, as a teaching profession. It's it's a really tricky time to be um, so invested and in, and in loving in in our teaching and be continually under fire by. Um, by policy, I think, and by the left and the right at this point. So what if we're able to be the bigger person and ignore all that and the brilliance that comes out from us? I mean, what if it's even about us not teaching? What if it's about us being there with our expertise, teaching when, when asked, mm -hmm. you know? And so maybe all this time we're spending on professional development isn't even necessary. Maybe it's professional development because we're in the act or in the you know vulnerability of context ourselves and that's our professional development you know yeah I, I love that I think that would be great I, and I'd be perfectly comfortable with that since I've gotten tenure right but if I was a, if I was a first or, or second tier your teacher or if I have a or if I'm you know going through a student teaching program these are these are really tricky times in terms of how we go through and the kinds of um, rigor we have to show, or if I'm trying to get my national board professional teaching. Well, what if um, we didn't even have all that, though? I mean, maybe that's that's the same idea as badges. You know, what if every day we needed to ask ourselves, you know, what if every day was we didn't have tenure? I, I like it. I don't. How do how do we get to that point? I I think we start freeing up spaces of permission for teachers and for kids to show the brilliance that they have when we don't enforce this publicly prescribed curriculum, you know. I don't I don't think we're gonna see it as long as we're we're saying this is what we're gonna learn today, mm -hmm. you know. I think if I think we can do all the same things we're doing right now as long as who's together in a room is per choice or in a space is per choice. Um, and then I, I don't think and that's kind of what I've been getting at. I don't think the sharing is be, gonna be an issue. I don't think the proof is going to be an issue. I think we, we base so much on mistrust. And I mean, why, why do we say we have to prove anything? What if we throw everything on some space like Wikipedia and we have everyone's eyes on it and it's just about sharing, you know, and there's no proof needed? Um, I, I know it sounds very utopian, but I'm to the point where what we're doing right now is much more risky and much more ridiculous than thinking along those lines. So, so let's get sort of meta on that question, Monica. What, so, so let's take your proposal here. Uh, there's been some question on this show for several weeks now about, you know, badges. Do we need badges? Um, when are they useful? When are they not useful? When do they get in the way of, as you so, you, as you say so beautifully, um, like the brilliance that that might come out if we didn't use badges? Um, but if we created a page on Wikipedia, could we really have a conversation there about badges in education? Maybe I don't know. 
or is there are there other platforms other ways to have the conversation is that a fair question i mean this is and and then taro could you say a little bit about the pressure that's coming around the money around all that stuff because that's driving the dialogue too isn't it right I yeah, I mean, I think the, there, but, yeah. I mean, I think the the way funding is tied right now um, seems to be sp particularly around specific forms of learning, um, which then comes to specific forms of teaching, right? And so I think we're becoming much more restrictive in what it means to be a teacher in the eyes of the state, in the eyes of um, the U.S. Department of Education, and how we're defining that, right? And so in becoming more restrictive, it, it really limits our. our I think it, I think it limits. The ways we spend dollars in in our schools, right? Um, again, this is this is just my opinion from from you know having been at Manual Arts and um, as a school that that's traditionally been viewed as low performing and having a very high dropout rate. Um, our, our dollars we, we get lots of money um, and then we don't use it very well, and so we get lots of principles over time, right? And so I think these two different things are are tied together, and um, it's not necessarily. Um, a lack of resources as much as a lack of conversation that connects us beyond the walls of South Central Los Angeles or beyond the walls of um, LA Unified School District or something like that. So I, I hear the call for something like what Monica is talking about, having like this kind of giant melting pot of conversation, I think that would inform the decisions and choices that are affecting students in, at my school. Um, but I also wonder about something like the tragedy of the comments, right? And, um, if, if you try to crowdsource that type of environment, um, how, how do you do that to create a very, I, I guess, like clean, open conversation versus one that gets tied to the way rhetoric fills, you know, a political debate, right? Um, so exactly. I, I don't know. I, I, what would you say, Monica? I, I was just agreeing. I mean, the key point of the conversation would be what does it mean to be low performing? I mean, we just, we say that, everyone says it so glibly. Yeah. And, and not that, these are bad people. It's just we're so used to it, and we're it's like we're addicted to saying that at the end of every sentence, and that's the root of the problem in my thinking. You know, mm. uh, what does it mean to be low achieving? Maybe maybe that's wrong. Maybe we've got that all wrong. Yeah. Well, we need and we need to go back and define right. The achievement right now is based on, you know, these these tests, which are based on these textbooks, and you know, I think there there's large conglomerations that are. That are kind of driving us into this giant hole we've been stuck in, and um, I, I think it would be nice to kind of have this like paradigm shift where you just kind of wipe the slate clean. But I also know pragmatically that's not going to happen for DeAndre in my first period class or something like that tomorrow, right? So um, I, I think there there's shifts that we can engage students with in, in thinking through pushing that forward. Um, yeah, it's. Mm -hmm. Day, or... I could... go ahead, Monica. Oh, I could go on forever. We should no, probably ahead. do this another day. <laughs> no, please. Well, that that I love the people that are doing all this with the badges, um, but because there is so much money involved with it, people aren't mm -hmm. questioning it. I mean, it's it's kind of like project-based learning has become so popular, but um, as Krishnamurti writes, partial freedom is no freedom. And I, re I really am believing that from the space my district has given me to really listen to kids without an agenda. Um, you say project-based learning and here's 10 things to pick from, or even if you don't just give them 10, you're back channeling it or back, you know, checkboxing it with, did you meet this for standards? I think we're kind of doing the same thing with the badges. It's like, tell us how to do the badges good. Well, what if, what if it's the badges themselves, even though they're better than they were before, um, we're still not going to see that brilliance if it's, if, you know, Khan Academy, um, people were all excited about it and, and kids were saying they loved math and they could do it. And then they got the badges and now people are saying kids are doing it for the badges. Um, whether that whole debate of Khan Academy aside, just looking at the badges alone. And I think if we, if we really zoom out and take a look, you can see how we would end up doing things for the badges. We're so used to checklists, and we're so used to a, a, a definition of productivity that um, I don't think is is a good definition of productivity. 
Yeah, I think we're in a space kind of like where we were six or seven years ago with like the small schools movement, right? And when small learning communities became the big buzzword for uh, like the Gates Foundation all of a sudden. It seems like badges could really become this place that um, everyone's going to kind of put all their eggs in the, the badges basket, right? And see if that's going to if that's gonna fix everything. And we'll put a lot of money in it. And at the end of the day, our school is going to look fundamentally different. Is, is learning going to be better, right? Or at, at least less low performing? And um, I'm, I'm skeptical. I don't know if I'm speaking correctly. I'm skeptical. I love, I love that we're offering more options, you know, that kids could now say, I learned this and, and I'm certified here. But I keep going back to Clay Shirky's example of the 10 daycare centers. And once you, once you change the atmosphere to it's a marketing thing or it's a proof thing, to me, badges are proof of something. Um, it completely messes with the mindset of the learner and, and it's like a raised eyebrow and now they're doing it for different reasons and again it'll be better than it was before so that's what's moving us forward but it's not going to get at the, the brilliance that we need from each individual mm. you know in order to make the world a better place and, and I want to try to bring it back to the OER conversation um, in this way, um, I think the dialogue that we are, we're having now and that Intero and Paulo and I had about this um, at the National Writing Project meeting on Thursday um, and others are having are really useful conversations. And I think the hope of open educational resources is not just that we can get our stuff out there legally. I think the hope is that we'll get teachers' voices out there in the conversation about badges, for example, or about whatever else is coming down the funding pike. Um, and I'm just wondering where is that happening? Um, I'm trying to use this as a specific example. I'm not satisfied that putting up a, a Wikipedia page about badges in education is enough. Certainly, maybe we should do that and see what happens but i'm just wondering like is my hope in an open educational resource community misplaced or is there a way for that community to to get these conversations out there does that make any sense yes yeah. i'm not following the putting badges up on wikipedia where did that come from it was your suggestion is that <laughs> You said oh. you said why don't we why don't we why don't we put an article up about badges or um, you know oh no 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 then then I misspoke or I miss whatever I I would never that what I'm thinking is mm -hmm. this whole idea of sharing and this whole idea of proof why don't we start modeling sharing things in spaces that are useful whether it's Wikipedia or not it's just the place that I see now that's a very used space. Um, so that we don't have to have proof. You know, if, if you want to know mm -hmm. if um, you've got someone coming into your company or whatever and you want to know what they've done in the past, I think the web is teaching us transparency so that it's not like I'm giving you a diploma and it could be fake, it could be real. This portfolio that I'm giving you could be fake or it could be real. No, it's the transparency of the web is showing you, well, look, at they've, they've added stuff to Wikipedia. They're really sharing their stuff with the world. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't. I didn't intend it to be badges on Wikipedia. I wasn't thinking of it in that way. No, I mean an article about badges, a, a, a conversation. I'm just wondering where we can have this conversation so it matters, so that people. So I know. Oh, there's a space. Yeah. And Taro, doesn't D, D, DML have a? Yes, yeah, so I was going to. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to say the the DML, the Digital Media and Learning Conference that um, MacArthur's putting together. Um, they're going to have a couple of different sessions that are really, I think, kind of like the, the like the Thunderdome for for the badges conversation, where two sides enter, one side leaves, or something. The Thunderdome. Um, and I know, I know, in March there'll be a large focus of that of that conference. What do you mean um, by I've been really trying to... are... The Thunderdome? Yeah. And Tara, tell us more about that because aren't you like in charge of that? And Karen, are you involved in that as well? Uh, I'm definitely not in charge, but I'm so of the I'm, I'm on the conference committee and I'm I'm, I'm looking at the um, innovations in public education strand. So I'm trying to get as many teachers involved in this conference in the past because I think 
there's some really great conversation that's building around these discussions happening at this conference in the past. Um, there's been very few teachers there, and so I think over time I've really kind of voiced complaint about that and said, you know, there's, this is great, but where are all the teachers? This is great, where are all the teachers? And after enough of me complaining, um, and they're like, well, we'll just put you on the conference committee. At least that's how I understand what happened. Um, you go, man. You go. <laughs> um, in any Karen, case. Karen, this, will you be there? Well, I'm hoping to be there, but I have a proposal submitted, so it's in others' hands. <laughs> Um, I, I think that spaces like that, not just necessarily DML, but I, I like that DML moves away from specific tools to, to think about um, digital learning context, um, which I think is, is different from like a space like ISTE or something like that. So that's why, that's why I think like that's a useful space to have these kinds of conversations. And, and Paul, I have to say, I think this, this Hangout, you know, and the MOOCs are starting to be on Hangouts like mm -hmm. this. Uh, that's what's drawn me to the web is um, waiting for some video, you know, abilities to feel like you've been in a coffee house with these people, you know. So I think what you're doing is um, huge in regard to spaces where we can have these conversations happen. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, and so I want to get back to what I made a joke at the beginning, but I can almost feel the answer to this, but I can't quite get there. So um, it's like, why should the teacher next door to me care about OER? And I and I don't and again I don't mean that as a challenge, but and and I think part I'll start the answer that I think I think part of it is that it makes our voices more powerful. We don't have to worry about copyright. We don't have to worry about getting accepted, you know, in different places. We can build our own spaces to to have our conversations. Um, can anybody else address that question? And if you don't like it, address whatever you'd like here at the end. <laughs> Karen, I think, what do you I think it's really oh, Go ahead, Andrew. Oh, good. Yeah. I, I was I, I was just going to kind of echo what you're saying there, Paul. I, I definitely think it's about um, the teacher next door, at least for me, is the teacher that's probably a little bit less engaged with open tools or with digital tools in general, right? Mm -hmm. And to get them to see that these tools aren't set in stone, it's like, oh, if I don't understand Edmodo or if I don't understand Google+, Plus, I, I'm not able to participate. I think that the, op the possibilities of OER um, are possibilities of including people across, you know, um, the, the amount of years of teaching or experience with technology and just kind of bringing other people into conversation and um, James G theorizes well, it saying. as an affinity yeah. space right where I have expertise in one area and you have expertise in another and this is kind of a meeting ground where we come together and, and share yeah. our various ta forms of tacit knowledge. Nice. I'm glad you got there. <laughs> yeah. Karen, what are you thinking as we are kind of finishing here? But go ahead. <laughs> Well, I think one of the exciting opportunities of OER beyond what we've talked about is mm -hmm. as an alternative to the commercial publisher offered canned curriculum. Mm -hmm. And OER is a way for us as teachers to kind of take back the curriculum and, you know, remix and, and build our own and, and differentiate. I, I do a lot of work with differentiating instruction. And it's really hard to do when you're in an environment with rigid textbook pacing. I mean, it's, I, I can't, it's crazy to hear people go, we're going to differentiate instruction. And they go, okay, now on Tuesday, everybody's going to be on page 92 of open court reading. I mean, it just, it doesn't make sense. And to me, OER is a way to um, have more flexibility, not just legally, but in the, in the bigger sense of sharing and adapting things that make sense for kids. Because more is available and because you can adapt it better. Because you can adapt it. I mean, that's mm -hmm. really huge. I, what got me into OER was trying to work with textbook publishers to put the, the electronic versions of stuff that schools had purchased and paid for and try to put them on mobile devices. And they pretty mm -hmm. much categorically would say, no, you can't do that. And that's crazy. I mean, we paid for this stuff. Well, and, you know, forget about changing it or, you know, we want to add vocabulary so it's more useful for kids. Oh, my gosh, forget that. 
you know, only they can do that. Well, thank you um, for coming by. And the two of you, please come by again. <laughs> We'd love to Definitely. continue these conversations, um, especially if we can get Bud to come on and talk about how they were able to use peer-to-peer -to, -peer to think about the Common Core. That's interesting, um, and then and then other ideas too. Um, Monica, you have any thoughts as we end here? Great chat room over there, by the way. And sorry, <laughs> one other thought. There's some talk in the chat room about how to keep together our hangouts with the chat and make it happen more. Is it is it true that there aren't bells now? You can turn the sound off that we can chat over here. Like Antero, you just put a message in there and I didn't hear any bell. So I don't know. Oh, there uh, I heard it. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, we have to think about that so that uh, we can integrate the the live stuff with the chat a little better than we're doing. Just a, a program note, I guess. Monica, any <laughs> thoughts? Just, um, I mean, this is great. And thank you guys. I think these conversations are huge. Um, off of Montero, I just talked about the affinity spaces that Paul G mm. talks about, um, the James Paul G, um, and conduits of conduits to communities of service and rhizomatic spaces just the fact that we are modeling these um places where there's no hierarchy you know and so people feel like they don't have to have the suit and tie on in order to communicate or share or um and and where sharing is more the focus than anything else um i think super important so glad to meet you karen and and thanks and Tara for, for joining us yeah definitely thanks a lot you guys thank you um should mention that we've been broadcasting here one of the places we try to keep all this together is at edtechtalk.com which is a channel of the world bridges network worldbridges.net and we also publish it up at um teachers teaching teachers.org and there's some link to it at uh, lab connections is it lab connections .org? is that right there, Monica's lab one connections of Monica's sites what lab connections.blogspot.com we've got it linked on the top there too Great. so thank you all um and we'll see you next time good night all right have a good thanks night. everybody have a good Thanksgiving thank you, you. Bye.